know. Oh no, how do you flip the camera? <laughs> you look great. <laughs> Thank you, but I'm so not used to seeing my face that way. I'm like, I oh, okay, flip this way. Whew, I was like, whoa. I, I know I have to look exactly at the camera, but my screen's over here, so it's kind of fun. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. My cat escaped from the basement, so sooner than later, you'll see a cat. <laughs> and hello, everyone. We're going to start in about two to three minutes, but we are so happy to see you all on this Friday. Uh, either it's afternoon or evening. Hello, everyone. We're going to be starting in about two minutes. Thank you for your patience. Okay. And of course, now my cat comes to join us. So, um, <laughs> I'm like, great, we'll have a cat in a little bit. But welcome, everyone. We are so happy to have you at this session. This is really an interactive gathering where we'll be sharing some insight, um, and that will be from Jay and Angie, and they'll introduce ourselves in a second. But. My name is Nikisha. I'm director of HR for Ripple Effect, and I have worked in HR for the past 15 years, and I'm really excited to talk about uh, ERGs, and I'll take that over to Jay to talk a little bit more and introduce himself as well. There's all. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Looks like we have 10 folks total on here. Uh, my name is Jay Aragon. I use they, them pronouns. I am a leader in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, and uh, I currently sit on Ohlone territory, so wanting to acknowledge the land that I am on, uh, virtually coming to all of you, and would love to hand it over to Angie. 
Hi everyone, my name is Angie or Angela. I go by either. I'm a talent acquisition specialist at Everlane and also uh, helping to co-lead one of our um, largest ERGs within the company. Um, I use she, her pronouns and I sit on uh, Yukut's land. Um, so just to get us started today, um, this session will give you tips on leading employee resource groups, ERGs. So if you hear us uh, say ERGs, we're um, referring to employee resource groups um, that are not only engaging, but effective. So we'll walk through steps and measures to ensure a, safe is, a space is truly a safe space. Um, it will talk about intersectionality and why it's important to this work. Um, what you can do to create safe spaces at work and within your community, um, and then tips on doing all of that remotely. Um, we hope everyone's able to walk away feeling empowered to use these tools to bring change to their community um, slash workplace. And this is a charla session, meaning that we'll be bringing the audience in to engage in conversation with us. Awesome. So the first question, again, how we will structure today is we're going to go through um, questions and then we really want this to be as interactive as possible. So uh, Jay and Angie will go through their answers and we would love for the audience to also pitch in uh, as well. So the first focal point is what steps and measures do you enable to ensure ERGs are truly a safe space? Jay, I'll let you jump in there. All righty. Uh, first of all, just wanted to share with everyone um, a couple like guidelines, community guidelines here. I know that Tequeria also has, we have our own guidelines, but just wanted to kind of touch on a few things. One of the things that kind of actually speaks to this topic in creating safe space for folks is also just like letting folks know what we're going to chat about. Angie touched on that. Nikisha also mentioned, but kind of running through an agenda of what we're going to talk about. Um, and then also just like um, as like an, a tip in anything that we talk about here or bring up, just being mindful of who's in the space. So like if we are gonna call on you to uh, interact with us or share what, if you if you have anything that resonates or you wanna share on anything, um, feel free to also say no. If, uh, if we call on you and also utilize the chat function, we just wanna acknowledge like the space and whatever you feel comfortable with. Also just wanting to, <laughs> hi Allison. <laughs> also Sorry. wanting to um, acknowledge that like if it doesn't feel good anymore or if you're not into this session feel free to leave the space like it's up to you you have the choice to do that um wanting to be mindful of like no cursing um i'm specifically using like trauma-informed space creating so no cursing if you can help it if not then we can just you know move forward and recover from that but no cursing no name calling uh, when one person is talking, trying not to interrupt anyone, just giving space there um, and introducing yourself uh, and then not making any assumptions about anyone else. So just whatever anyone shares with you, that's where you're coming from. Um, and we'll kind of I'll kind of get into that a little bit more, but just wanted to touch on those things. Um, and the community agreements is one thing that I think stands out in any workplace. If there isn't like a community agreement in some sort of the place that you work, it might be a good idea to start making one. Um, I've definitely been at organizations where it didn't exist yet. And although it might seem very common sense, it's not, it, not, it, it isn't always common sense for everyone. And I think assuming what is common knowledge is also like something that we can take into account, acknowledging people from different backgrounds and, um, upbringings, different places in the world. So that's one thing I definitely wanted to, to talk about. And then having a designated moderator um, in any space, whether it's virtual, in person, if it's on screen, having someone that can just be like, okay, like, I think we want to move on. We want to make sure we give everyone a chance to speak if they want, if they choose to. And then um, if it's just messaging, say it's in like a Slack messaging platform, at least someone can kind of weigh in and have that conversation one on one in a direct message conversation in case someone does perhaps offend someone or say something a little bit not as considerate. Um, that way it doesn't have to be this like public shaming or uh, I want to prove a point to educate you in front of everyone. I think one on one works really like best across the across the board. It's definitely something for me that has helped in um, uh, being a leader in 
a community that isn't accessible to everyone, it's really important for me when I see something that might be harmful or hurtful to others that I just reach out to them in a direct message and and with like with grace too. And I think Angie will kind of touch on that as well. Um, so I'll, I'll kick over to you. Yeah, definitely um, agree in the community agreements as well as uh, code of conduct. I think just to jump into the difference between those two. So code of conduct really should come from your organization, how employees um, are acting on a daily basis, how they communicate with each other on a day to day. Um, whereas that community agreement is really specific to the people who are in that space. So having a common, having a common understanding of what ev how everyone presents themselves when they come into the space and how they interact with each other, um, especially something like that you pointed out, Jay, if someone's called on for an answer and you don't want to answer giving people the space to say no um, and giving them that option to not participate if they're not ready to but also opening other avenues for people to share um, their thoughts that they might have like sharing on slack or messaging um, the moderator separately um, just to make sure that everyone feels comfortable in sharing that space because a lot of times in um, community spaces especially in employee resource groups we're talking about topics that are pretty um, sensitive and that are pretty personal to people. And so making sure that everyone feels comfortable in that space when they're sharing. Yeah, and then I think um, we, we, we're gonna talk about a lot more in all of these, um, these focus points and looks like we have four, but Nikisha, would it, do you think that we should um, call on anyone if anyone so chooses, if they wanna ask anything or share anything? Yes, so I put in the Q&A uh, what our, okay. first, our first focus point, don't worry, I got you, our first focus <laughs> point. Um, and I would love for some conversation, whether you would like to put uh, your thoughts within the chat box. And I see a message from Judith and she, and um, I don't see your pronouns, but they would like to know, do you have any examples of community agreements? We recently started talking about inclusive language, but I loved hearing from Jay about a community agreement. Yeah, um, I know you mentioned me in this one, but Angie, if you have thoughts first that you wanted to share with that question. We'll go for it. Hear. Okay. Um, yeah, I think in terms of community agreements, sometimes it's very, uh, might be self-explanatory, like, please like refrain from using profanity. Like that might be very obvious in a work setting, like as we're trying to be as professional as possible. And um, the one reason of, of refraining from using, like I'll speak to that example specifically, is it can be really triggering for folks as um, profanity can be linked to aggression in a lot of ways. And if you're, if you have communities of color, it is uh, not a, um, an isolated experience that um, we grew up with a lot of that in our households growing up and can be kind of triggering. So um, that's one thing I would say that I don't think I've seen a lot in other community agreements, and I would love to see that. Um, another example can be introducing yourselves with your pronouns in all spaces. So whether that's virtually, when we go back to the office, um, it is imperative for someone like me who doesn't have the option to choose whether or not to share my pronouns. Um, it makes someone like me and other folks like me or people that use she, they pronouns or they, she or ze, zer when you get into neo pronouns, it just makes us feel safer. And like, we know that people want to create an inclusive environment. So whether that's been done already, or it's something that you want to roll out, there are many like consultants, I do that on the site as well, that can help you come in and roll that out. That's one thing I would say. And then another thing that you saw us do as well is the land acknowledgement. Again, really inviting, creating an inclusive space for folks who are indigenous and um, acknowledging that the land we stand on is, is not ours and it's not the names that they have been renamed. Um, so those are a few things that are very, very basic, but super easy to do and super easy to write out. Um, also uh, tapping into your networks, like Tecadilla has so many different resources that for, for our community agreements here, and then also with like out in tech, um, I'm a leader on that, on that team there. And we have our own as well. And it gets way more detailed in terms of like, hey, if you violate these community agreements, here's what will happen. Here are the steps. 
so you know exactly. And so if anyone says anything outside of these community guidelines or um, after you agree to it, if you uh, go against that agreement, you can be held accountable. That's also included in creating a safe space is the accountability piece. Hey, you signed this agreement, wanted to just double check that you understood what you agreed to. Um, I've had many conversations like this where I'm like, it's written right here, you know, three sort of steps here, three, three chances to sort of get it right. And here's what's gonna happen now. Um, and having a process in place to deal with and to hold folks accountable. This is really imperative because community agreements are great, but if there's nothing happening after, like <laughs> it doesn't really do much except for make people feel like warm and fuzzy. Um, so yeah, but, but the warm and fuzzies go away if there's no accountability. So just a couple of things there. And also Judith, like feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and I can potentially help um, send resources, but this is a great question that I think a lot of organizations are still learning. I guess I have a follow-up question for you both. When you think about the community agreement and how busy we are in our communities and our in work as well, how long should that be? Is there a special length? I don't think so. I think what feels good, like the most important part of the community agreement is the community, like making sure that everyone is aligned to um, some of the guidelines that you're creating for that space. So I think depending on the amount of people that are in the space, what topics you're touching on will determine what that community agreement looks like. Um, it's also not like set in stone, right? Like you can go back and definitely um, shift the community agreements if things in your space starts to change or you think uh, you feel like the community agreements aren't really doing what they need you need them to do in that space. Um, Jay, I would love to open that up to you too. But I think, um, you know, reaching out to the community and getting their ideas as well, because you want to make sure it's not, you're not writing these in independently and by yourself and then asking people to agree to them. You're kind of coming together collectively to create um, this space together. Yeah. Um, there's a quote by someone from the movement for folks who are disabled um, that goes nothing for us without us. And this is just like overall, just what I think folks need to just like embody, live it, love it, learn it. Um, because if you're creating these community guidelines for someone who hasn't experienced much adversity or considers themselves or doesn't consider themselves part of these marginalized groups, I think it's like, you're going to be missing out on a lot and you're going to have folks that are just going to be like, OK, well, this excludes me. So what do I do? I don't feel safe to to share because it wasn't even offered to me. And also I wanted to touch on like not to make sure we're not tokenizing folks either, because I can't tell you how many times like people have come to me because they know I'm an expert in lived experiences in a lot of these categories um, where I'm like, I didn't volunteer this. And also it's not going to be for free. Like just asking people to quote unquote pick their brain to to take up their time and and try to learn everything that they want to share i think is um it's a missed opportunity to pay someone for their work and for their labor and utilize you know their expertise so a couple of things there just like pay people for their work uh don't assume anything and like um see if you can kind of put the feelers out there for people who want to engage, who choose to, rather than reaching out to singling anyone out. I like that. I think that's very important too. Um, I would love to hear more from the audience. Any thoughts or suggestions? I'm not one to call on people. <laughs> But I would love to to hear some thoughts and suggestions, or uh, we can maybe move to the next focal point. And if not, too, like one thing that maybe might spark something for folks is like if they've seen any set of community guidelines or codes of conduct that they liked, like something that stood out to them, or something they'd like to see added to their organization. Great question. Crystal has a question. What are the best ways to get the ERG engaged and interactive? And yeah. I, oh, 
I actually think uh, later on in uh, one of the later focal points will definitely touch um, perfectly on, on that question, Crystal. Crystal, I'm just curious, have you uh, tried or do you, you know, uh, to build the ERG? Uh, any thoughts that you have in regards to making it interactive? And also, it looks like it'll come up again. So, Crystal, if you don't. Oh. Perfect. So at the moment, I guess and we're going to cover this. So at the moment, I'm trying to get Pride ERG more engaged. So this is going to be great. Um, planning a drag brunch. I've been to three this year. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. We'll talk a little bit more about getting um, different groups engaged, especially, you know, making sure that you have a wide variety of ways to get people engaged because everyone likes different things. So that's great. Okay. And you put down, um, was just wondering what else can be done. Yeah, we'll talk right about that. So that's great. Any other thoughts before we go to the next focus point? Or experiences? Again, this is a, a great place to hear from. Um, any recommendations on creating a proposal for DEI initiatives? I am two months in my role, but plan to see to HR and looking to build on this. Do you want to give a little bit of a spoiler or? <laughs> <laughs> Jay, if you want to take that one. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, I definitely want to answer your question, Candida. And I think we'll share more. We'll share more here. Um, Cause I know we have four focus points and I'm sure there'll be more questions. That <laughs> you can wait. Yeah, I, I hate, I hate saying, I hate making people wait. Um, but yeah, I think I think we'll get into it a little bit more and also around like creating ERGs and like what that looks like. But the yeah, yeah. So we can we can we'll get to that. Awesome. Another um, I have a question that was sent over and um, it's from Anonymous. And I believe we're going to cover this in the, in the next one. But I'm struggling to engage a remote Latinx ERG. I also love some ideas. Engagement definitely is something that we'll be covering. So let me not waste any more time and go over to focus point number two. <laughs> what is intersectionality and why is it important to creating safe spaces? Pass it over to who would like to go first. Yeah, intersectionality is a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and the idea of intersectionality is really recognizing all the different points of someone's um, uh, of where someone is, and that could be in terms of your identity, your ethnicity, your race, um, your gender, your sexual orientation, um, all the things. And so in, intersectionality is really important to this work in understanding that people are going to have completely different experiences. And depending who they are and where they come from and how they identify is really gonna show how they show up in that space and how they have conversations with people, what they engage in, um, what they'd like to talk about. Um, I think it's really important to this work because it allows for anyone who hasn't um, really sat down and thought about their identity and how they show up in a space. This is a time for self-assessment, right? When you think about yourself and how you show up in a space, it's really important in creating safe spaces because um, if you're not aware of maybe, let's say, you're not aware that, um, for example, for me, what it feels like not only being a woman in the tech industry, but being a black woman in the tech industry, being a Latin ex woman in the in the tech industry um, puts me at this um, crossroad where I have different experiences than those around me. So, for example, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, but moved to California two years ago. And so one of the self assessments I had to do walking into new spaces in California was really starting to think about 
Californians don't really know what a Dominican experience is. Because Dominican Republic is, so, the Caribbean is so far from here. There are no direct flights, you know. A lot of the Latinx communities here are not from the Caribbean. And so when I came into these spaces, the food that I knew, the language, some of the language that I was using, um, I had to start code switching in completely different ways than I used to when I was in New York because I started realizing, wow, people don't know what I'm talking about. People aren't familiar what it's like to grow up in a concrete jungle where I went to a high school with 10 floors and no sports teams. Um, so, you know, it's really, that's really important thinking about where you come from and how you show up in a room and what you bring to to that room, being conscious. And that doesn't mean um, suppressing parts of yourself or suppressing parts of your identity. It means embracing those parts of yourself, being able to acknowledge that I do have a different experience and I can open people up to a whole different part of culture, a whole new culture that they may have never engaged with before. I love that. Jay? Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that, Angie. I think. Um, I think one thing uh, that folks get kind of stuck in in creating employee resource groups is that we're just like one dimensional, that we're only one part of ourselves. And it misses the mark in terms of like not embracing every single person individually and like collectively. So for example, if there's like a women's ERG and then there's like the Latinx ERG like a lot of the folks might be in this in both. So, uh, uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but in terms of like having events with both and acknowledging both and having the leaders from both, it is remiss. It would, it would, um, it would be a huge miss if folks just acknowledged one part. Uh, this is just a women's event or uh, we want to acknowledge all of the women in this group. And if it's open to people who are non-binary, like all of like, say that, say who it's inclusive of, say why, having a mission statement of, of what the group is about and what you hope to achieve is always really helpful too. But I think what's what I've seen missing overall at a lot of organizations is we're so focused on like being seen by just us. We also miss seeing other groups and we all want the same thing. We all want to feel seen. We all, all want to be appreciated and to celebrate ourselves and others. But like, we'll get more done if we work together. So I would love to see like more opportunities for folks of, of different ERGs coming together to do more work together. Um, and, and I think with that piece in mind, it doesn't become a very like siloed group where people just feel like, oh, you know, um, I'll use the example of like a Latinx group and a, um, a LGBTQ plus group. For me, I haven't always felt safe in a Latinx group, uh, but maybe I felt safe in a LGBTQ plus group and vice versa. Sometimes I don't feel safe in the LGBTQ plus group, which is like, whoa, being someone who's queer that and, and trans, like that's a big deal if it's, if it's exclusive, if it's excluding trans folks or trans folks of color. So I think, um, but then it might feel safer in the Latinx group. So like, what are these groups doing differently and how can they all be safer? Isn't there a place where like cleaning folks leading these groups? I know that it's voluntary, but I think it would be really helpful if folks had a way to, uh, I don't know, go through a process where it's not just like completely voluntary, uh, that someone who's holding space for folks knows how to hold space. And if not, using resources to pay folks who can. I think it's really important to, to save folks from experiencing harm. Got some, we got a question. Mm -hmm. I was uh, putting some questions in the chat box um, and got some answers, but we do have some questions um, that are coming in. And um, really just goes back to some of the questions about how to create that safe space. And one is that I got from Anonymous. I think it's crucial that we allow room in the community agreements for people to make mistakes. How do you keep community agreements from community policing? So kind of going back to our focus point number one, but I guess with the additional knowledge that we've gained from number two as well. So what do you both think about that one? I'll start with you, Angie. 
Yeah, I totally agree in allowing room for people to make mistakes. Um, it's a two-way street, right? Like acknowledging how your mistake may have hurt someone. Um, and I think there's always room to have conversation. I think that's the most important part of the community agreement is reminding each other that this should always be a conversation. Um, and I think going into spaces, um, assuming that people have positive intent um, and they're not trying to hurt someone. Um, and I think if someone does make a mistake or does hurt someone in a safe space, um, leaving room to have that conversation, um, reaching out to the person who might have been hurt and you know asking them how they're feeling. Um, you wanna make sure that that person still feels safe in the space as well, um, but also encouraging the person who made the mistake, You know, do you, are there more resources that we can share with you? Um, are, would you like to have like one-on-one -on -one conversations? Um, also making sure that they understand their mistake, right? It's hard to make a change if you not if you don't quite understand the mistake that you made. Um, so talking through with that person and just like um, seeing if they understand the mistake that they made, what 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 would help them feel more safe um, to continue showing up to that space even though that they, they made that mistake. Um, and I think. You can also make that room in your community agreements. You make those agreements with the people that you're talking to. So that's something that you can raise as you're creating them. What happens if someone makes a mistake in this space and what actions are we willing to take when someone does? Yeah, and how do you measure the, the brevity of each mistake? And if a microaggression is felt as not just a mistake, right? Like how are we defining mistakes? And then what is uh, microaggressions? What are macroaggressions, examples of these so that it's just right there written out. Um, I think when you're creating it with community, uh, it's not it's not policing. It's uh, it's community based care. And um, and so I think that's a huge one. Uh, I also think in terms of like creating spaces for people, which we'll get to this again. And I think this goes to one of the other questions around like engaging remote, a uh, remote Latinx ERG. And this goes for everyone as we're for the most part, seemingly all remote. Accessibility is the main thing that could be stopping you from engaging in any community. We're virtual, we're only here on screens. And if it's not a time that makes sense for people to still allow a work-life balance, they're not gonna show up. They're not gonna be engaged and they might like lose care to show up because they're like, oh, they don't care about me. They didn't even think about where I live. They're not even taking into account that I have a family or maybe you don't know that they have a family and they do because they don't feel safe enough to share with you. So there's like all of these different elements, but first and foremost, if you're trying to connect with people, just like we're connected here, we're all in different places. And yet we were, only allowed we were only allowing ourselves to show up here because the time made sense for all of us mm -hmm. so we we had to make this happen we agreed on this so i think this is a huge piece that some people miss out on if it works for the leaders it works for everyone it's not the case and sometimes you're missing out on a lot of folks because you're not even trying to um, have different times like if you have two separate times when you meet a week one of them is for people who are maybe on the earlier side one for people who are on the later side in the afternoons, depending on where everyone's located. But then you can really accommodate people also in their working style, also as a person. Do they want to talk about things that might be heavy in the, in the morning? Do they want to talk about things that might be weighing on them in the afternoon? Like these are really big uh, conversations that could be happening where you're just like, hey, it's the morning. How was everyone's weekend? And that's another thing that I think is like not creating safe space. If you're assuming and talking about people traveling and, and talking about people's weekend, but then there was a lot of like civil unrest that happened over the weekend, specifically to black, indigenous, uh, Latinx, um, the AAPI community and so forth, like that re is really missing the mark. So making sure that you're really tapped in with your communities and really like, how are where are folks' hearts at today? Like, where are we at? Like, or, or maybe if it's more uh, joy focused, like, where, where are y'all finding joy right now in your day or in your lives? Like more questions to get in a little bit deeper and, and offering space for folks. Awesome. Chat box kind of went a little bit uh, busy. So here goes our next message for Arceli. And I, um, speaking of sharing experiences, how do you create the safe spaces for individuals to share their experiences? I'm currently leading a series with the first topic being living in duality 
She's living two different lives. I'm hoping I can convey a safe environment for interactive discussion. It's a great, great question. Pass it on. I think when you're asking people to share something really personal, especially on a specific topic, the first place to start is creating a very clear agenda slash mission um, for that time that you're meeting so that people can have an expectation of what they are willing to share when they show up to that space. Um, when you have a really clear mission, really clear agenda for a meeting, it allows people to determine Am I ready to step into a space like that? Am I ready to share something as personal as I am rather than kind of showing up in this space and then they're being asked to share something personal? And that can be really anxiety driven for a lot of people. I know that that sometimes happens to me when I'm not expecting to share something really personal and kind of put on the spot. I, I tend to like sit back a little bit and retreat within and, and really think about what I feel safe about sharing. So I think first step there would really be creating a clear agenda. Um, if living in duality is what you're wanting to talk about, digging in deeper to that, whether it's like one to two sentences about what that means and what you want people to get out of this space. Mm -hmm. Michael brought up a really great point. Um, sometimes I felt more comfortable in our own unofficial networks than in our official ERGs. Yeah, what that tells me is, because I felt that too, uh, mm -hmm. what that tells me is a couple things, not making any assumptions there, but I'll go off of speaking from my own experience. When I have felt that, it's because the people leading those ERGs were self-appointed and um, a lot of times white, cisgendered, heterosexual, so there's not really much lending up to experience from from being marginalized or excluded in any way, shape or form as that is seen as somewhat of the default. And so I think um, folks get uh, kind of like, oh, when I founded this ERG or when I started this ERG or, or whatever the ERG is specifically, um, it might have been like, okay, well, how long ago was that? How different was the organization, the culture, the people that work here? Mm -hmm. Things look differently now. Would love to have a say as we are part of this community. But if there's no space or or um, funnel for you to share how you're feeling excluded in that community, how is it going to change? How is it going to be more inclusive? So I think that that's a piece across the board at all companies that I would like to see more of as well is just like a place to share thoughts, even if just anonymously on a survey hey, you know, why do you think you're involved or not involved? What would help you feel more involved or feel safer in these spaces? Um, and really guaranteeing that anonymity. I, I've definitely also felt like this isn't that anonymous because of folks who have shared what they've read or maybe it was like obvious because we have a specific um, experience or identity to us. But I think, um, I think that speaks to the people leading those organizations. Because if you also don't feel safe enough to share, like, I don't feel that comfortable there and I feel comfortable in an unofficial network. Who's leading the unofficial network? Who who are the voices that are gathering folks and creating the safe spaces there? Because I think it's might be clear if they so choose to take on a role like that. What I've seen also in, in order to have folks who are creating this safe space and taking on this work is that to pay leaders of employee resource groups, pay them for all of this extra time and labor of organizing and creating. Um, because a lot of the times people stay because of those ERGs. They stay at their companies because it's the only place they do feel safe if they do. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that, Michael. I think it's, it's a big one. Mm -hmm. Chris, um, Mention happy to connect and chat about work and life balance and emotional intelligence training to help develop psychological safety in uh, ERGs. Which is awesome. I think that's very, very important to have that your safety because again, uh, we can set up all these different channels to share. But again, you know, we want to have psychological safety as well. Jay or Angela, do you have any experience in those areas? Okay, 
I just wanted to give Angie the floor because I was talking about. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was like, I was like, what? <laughs> just me. Um, thank you so much, Chris, for um, offering that up to the group as well. Um, I think definitely I can help with uh, work-life balance. Um, it's all about setting boundaries, and I think I have past year has been about boundary setting for me, <laughs> um, totally. Um, in terms of like emotional intelligence and psychological safety, I don't wanna say that I'm an expert in that space. Um, so I'll pass it to you, Jay. Awesome. Um, I wanna do a quick time check because mm -hmm. I have no idea when we actually started. Don't worry, uh, I know we have two minutes on this question. <laughs> oh, cool, okay. Um, yeah, so a couple of things just wanted to like remind us of, of um, in any spaces, checking your privilege is gonna be a huge one. Um, for me, as someone in this space, uh, as a light-skinned Latinx person, it is imperative that in this room, this virtual room with Nikisha and Angie, that I speak last every time. That is part of creating a safe space. So like colorism is very real. Uh, what I have experienced in this world is not the same as Angie, is not the same as Nikisha. And in any spaces where you're trying to create safe spaces for Black folks, for Indigenous folks, for uh, Brown folks, uh, people of color, um, it's important that that is something that's also in the guidelines. Because again, this is like an unspoken rule uh, that I think is not written down all the time because I think we're we're really worried about carrying our uh, our white counterparts. We're worried about carrying their guilt and we're worried about uh, decentering them. But that is the only way that we're going to take the power away from mm -hmm. from white supremacy and uh, and decenter that whiteness is to uh, put the power back, uh, give the power back. And so that's one thing I just wanted to to share a little bit more about. Um, I'm just an offering. Yeah, thank you for that offering, Chris. Um, and then along with the checking your privilege, it's also, I think Angie, you touched on this, but the self-assessment, like where are you at? What are your privileges? I think this is a great exercise that a lot of diversity, equity, inclusion consultants, um, leaders of could help to do. I think they could stand to do more training around this. If we all kind of like literally wrote down all of our pr privileges and, and maybe, uh, a lot of things would surface. Like we are non-disabled folks. Um, I am living with a disability, but physically I, I am non-disabled. So um, mm -hmm. I, it's really important to check and see which groups we're a part of and which groups that we aren't. And then how can we learn more about these groups? How can we be more inclusive for these groups? Um, never heard of that. We'll be making a point from now on. Oh yeah, thanks Maricela. Uh, I'm gonna move to Sorry, Jay. I'm going to move Yo, to ahead, point ahead. number three and just if we could, I am watching the time this time. So we have about six minutes on this question because I want to make sure we get to number four in our closing. But what can people do to create safe spaces at their workplaces and outside of work as well? So Crystal, circling back on your question here, um, I think the very first thing is knowing your audience. Um, so one of the things that I love to do um, anytime that I join a space or have led a space is it's as simple as creating a survey, right? So this is actually something I just did um, within the employee resource group that I helped to lead. Um, and it was actually the second time or third time we've sent out this survey. We like to send it out every so often, you know, because things change for people all the time. Um, so knowing your audience, um, figuring out what works for people, um, going back to your earlier point, Jay, when's the... Uh, best time for them to meet during the day? What day of the week, in the morning, in the afternoon? Um, what do they want to talk about in those spaces? You don't want to assume the conversations that people want to have, like really get to understand what your community needs out of this group. Um, so whether that's career growth, whether that's a safe space just to share what's happening in there every day um, at work, um, whether that's uh, just wanting to network and connect with other people in the company that share similar experiences as you. Um, you know, so really starting to figure out what your community is looking for um, and what they need. And so you can start identifying those needs and that's how you start to begin to build programming that's targeted right at what um, your community is asking you for. Yeah, and just uh, piggybacking off of that, I think one of the things that has really changed my worldview and how I speak to people, 
uh, think about what people want or need, or if I assume in a space in, in terms of like assuming any uh, positive intent is also like, not uh this is what i've heard as like depending on how you grew up with whatever religious influences and how that has shown up we at least for me i'll speak for myself again um i was taught to do uh treat people how you would want to be treated i want to bring that to the next level and when i heard this it absolutely blew my mind um to treat people how they want to be treated this is huge this doesn't assume that people are the same as you like how it, we're all so different. So if we're just assuming that people want exactly what we want or need what we want or need what we need, excuse me, it also means that like all of the like cis straight men who come from money, it, like if they're just treating me how they would want to be treated, like I wouldn't be treated how I want to be treated in any way. Like we don't know that. So I think it's really important for us to just acknowledge like treating people how they want to be treated because we all have different needs and wants so just acknowledging that piece i really wanted to share that um because i remember the first time i heard it i believe my partner shared it with me and i was just like wow like this is gonna change the game um yeah and what please doing is on. building relationships right like you're building yeah. relationships with people and i think people tend to reserve like the idea of like love language, you know, how people communicate best within romantic relationships. I feel like people save that too much for romantic and familial relationships. You really should be communicating with everyone like that. Um, think about your friendships that you have. If you have like, I can think about me, I have five different friends and I communicate with all of them very differently. I have one friend who loves to be on FaceTime all the time with me. She loves texting me. She loves group chats and sending funny memes. I have another friend who's not fond of being on the phone and much would much rather text um, or talk to me in person, meet up for dinner or for drinks. Um, you know, so really understanding um, what people need in a space. And that's also something that you can put um, in a survey that you send out is like, how do you best communicate? Um, how do you best receive feedback? How do you best learn? Because um, not everybody learns the same way as well. Yeah. Um, one thing also, uh, this goes to um, someone's question about building an ERG. I wanted to just touch on a way that I'm seeing more of like the siloed ERGs and like what can be done better. So let's say there's like already exist one employee resource group. Uh, mm -hmm. I think another way to connect folks in community is to share events that are happening for all the groups. This is one thing I saw by two amazing Black women leaders for the Black ERG at Pinterest. When I was at Pinterest, uh, I was in one of the meetings as you know, just an ally, I didn't speak or anything. I'm just a guest in that space. And one of the things that um, Brie Hall, so Brie Hall and Abita, they both were the leaders of this group. And um, Brie shared a slide that had all every single ERG and what events were coming up for them. So how could this, how could the black community also show up for these other ERGs? And how could we be allies together and building for each other? This is something I hadn't seen before. This is something I'm like, of course, this is amazing. Every ERG can be doing this. Therefore connecting together and working together. How can we help y'all today? How can we help your ERG? Uh, how can we share about your event? Like what communication would you like us to send? Because each group is like powerful in their own way. And I think if we're if we're uplifting each other more, we can get more done and we can put more resources together. So um, I forget whose question. I think it was yours, Candida, around like setting up a proposal for DEI initiatives. It's also like which groups are already kind of forming those and getting all of those minds together in one room to see what do you want, putting that down on paper, what do you need and like from the people that you're presenting it to and then what does it look like? Like how much do they need to put in in order to support y'all? What does it look like? What do you need? Um, I think this is a huge one. This is how community organizations get created, grassroots. People that want something together and then they just like start doing it. And sometimes there's no, there's no specific guideline. It's just like, here's what we want. Here's what we need. Can you give us this? Um, so that's like a place to start. Uh, it sounds like that is something on the horizon for you, Candida. A bit more questions. 
it looks like yes, I want, but I want to be make sure that we're on time. But I do, I think that number four might get into Miguel's question. So let me just start off with number four. Um, what feedback would you give to employees and or employers in creating these safe these uh, spaces in a remote world? Um, I'd love to jump in and just touch on Miguel's question really quickly. And I think Miguel, if you're comfortable sharing with that ERG um, the fact that you know they're not um, acknowledging the socioeconomic background differences, especially within tech, I completely relate to that. So again, I moved from New York City to um, California working in the tech in San Francisco Bay Area. And a lot of the things that I would hear when I'm sitting in in conversation, like casual, casual conversations with coworkers, um, you know, people talking about going away for the weekend to their second family home. And I'm like, I've never had the first family home before. I don't know what that experience is or talking about how they used to go on um, like family vacations every summer. It was a thing for their family to meet and go on vacation together, no matter how old they got, like always coming together and being able to go out of the country together and things like that. Um, I think being able to acknowledge that within a group is super important that not everybody had access to the same things. And I think if you're comfortable sharing that with um, the Latinx group that you're within, please, I encourage you to, chances are you're not the only person that feels that way within that group. Um, so if you do feel comfortable sharing that, I would. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable sharing that, I think, yeah, reach out to other people that you feel comfortable talking to and sharing that information with and see if you can gather a few other folks that feel the same way as you. And maybe all of you can go to the Latinx ERG group together and like, hey, we have some ideas as to how we can um, open up this group and touch everyone who's here. Um, again, assuming that people have positive intent and not that they're not purposefully leaving out those details, but maybe someone just hasn't brought that to their attention yet. Awesome. Um, yeah, and Miguel for this question as well, because um, it's a really important one, because this is accessibility, this is feeling included, this is feeling safe, uh, this is acknowledging a trauma-informed space, this is acknowledging someone who's leading the ERG not having like a trauma-informed space or education or background. Um, so if it feels too scary to like say like, here's what we wanna see more of. You could always ask if they're open to hearing ideas to engage the community more. This I've found is really a really easy way to open up the conversation. So folks who are leading don't feel like you're poking at their methods or something because if they're still doing a lot of work and it's still not sitting, like if it's not feeling good for you, that can sometimes, people can project essentially, right? Like I'm doing all this work. Like, what do you mean you wanna see more of it? Like, I'm just like, I'm going all the way to worst case scenario, right? Um, if this is one of the things that intimidates about spaces, I know I've, I've felt that myself. Um, but yeah, just like opening it up, like, would y'all be open to doing something like this? I talked to a few folks and it sounds like we might, maybe that could be cool. Like, what do y'all think? And then again, just like throwing it back to them, if they're open to it, if they shut it down right away, then you know you have to build a business case with other folks and say like, hey, these seven people and I chatted and we'd love to see this. Like, how can we make that happen? Like, what do I need to do to help you to make that happen? Um, I think that's a huge one because when, when folks hear about something that they haven't thought of themselves, they hear and see only extra work. And so if you're willing to also like disperse that, and even if it's just ideas, then I think that will help um, create more open-mindedness with the leaders if you can't like you know, to say the leaders are shit and you want to like, uh, excuse me, if the leaders are, are crap and you don't want to, um, you know, uh, you don't want them to be the leaders anymore. If you don't have that choice, if you don't have that agency, that power, like this is what you can do. Um, and I've seen that work success successfully too. So hopefully that helps Miguel with what Angie shared and with what I shared. Awesome. Do we want to add anything in additional in regards to you know what feedback to give employees or employers? I understand that we only have four minutes, but in case there's anything that we want to add before we move to wrap up. Um, 
Um, yes, yeah, someone actually asked earlier about um, creating these spaces in a remote world. Um, I think the very first thing that Jay and I kind of agreed upon when we first um, put this question on the board for us was giving yourself grace and patience. And I think that's true for everything that we talked about so far today. Um, really looking and just like, there's a lot going on in the world right now. Um, this is the first time all of us have had to zoom in, be in these virtual portals. Um, and it's a lot to deal with, right? Like, so just giving yourself that grace and that patience to say, okay, you know, sometimes things might not work the way that you want them to. Maybe you not, you're not able to put on as much programming as you would like. Um, but remembering that everyone probably feels as fatigued as you do um, and doesn't want to jump in another Zoom meeting, doesn't want to sit um, behind a camera for like an extra hour after their day. Um, so really just saying to yourself, acknowledging what's going on around the world, what's going on for you personally, you know, back to that self-assessment, what's going on for me, what am I able to take on? Um, and really being honest with yourself, especially if you're an ERG lead. I found myself in this position um, this year too, where I feel like I'm not doing enough, but then I also had to remind myself boundaries. I'm, I'm one person and while I do have a team and I have a co-lead with me, I can only take on so much, even though I would love to be a lot more present in that space and have so much more programming, there's only so much that I can do. What I recommend there and what I try to do is turn back to your community group um, because even though I am a co-lead, I think everybody in the community is a leader. Everybody should be able to have a voice and have an opinion on what's going on in the group. So some, if you're not able to take on that time quite yourself, really turn back to the group and say, hey, who's interested in leading the next session? Or who's interested, um, who has some ideas for some upcoming program that, programming that you'd like to lead? Really tapping in other people in the community um, to help there. Yeah, plus one, plus one to everything Angie shared, it's something that we definitely like um, have some resonance with. Another thing, um, I think we kind of touched on a little bit before, but taking into account like time zones, where's everyone at? And if you don't know, because if folks keep getting hired because there's a lot of movement right now in the workforce, send out a quick little survey, just a quick little form to fill out. Where's everyone at? We want to make sure we can like have something that people can actually attend and we want to meet you all and we want to know more about each other but first we want to know where everyone's at so we can even communicate to figure out these things because not everyone lives on slack or is reading their emails depending on your role your position it's just like not where folks are at sure if you're in sales and recruiting you read your emails like it's everything but other roles engineers uh program managers like they're not necessarily living in those places so just taking that into account where people even prefer to be communicated that you're sharing a survey so it all just goes back to accessibility um, and um, having a few different sessions. So not just like, this is the only one of the week or something, um, but just like, hey, here's one of them and we're gonna have another one at this time. So letting folks know and also have the agency to choose. We're gonna have two this week. One's gonna be at this time. If you can't attend, please let us know, reach out here. If you can't get a hold of them, reach out to this person, like have a plan in place so you can gather that. And when you have those events, this is huge because I've been to something where it what didn't feel great. So I didn't really go back because it didn't feel safe for me. I wanted to share, but I was scared to share. Um, having a place anonymously and again, communicating that's anonymous, make sure it's actually anonymous and ask how people felt. What would they change? What would they like to see added? Um, what would make them, what would create more excitement within them to attend more events? Um, this is huge because if you're not tracking this feedback, how can you create a better place for people? How can you create a more inclusive space? So this one's huge because even if you have one great event that felt great for you, it's really important to still gather feedback because most likely it wasn't amazing for every single person, especially as we're virtual. So people just really just like this space being virtual. Like it's really hard to share space sometimes. So <laughs> just another thing I wanted to, to share there. Awesome. And now we're coming to the close. Uh, we actually are at the close. So I'm going to uh, turn this over to Jay, but I'm so thankful for this conversation thus far and the questions. It really helped me as an HR leader determine how I can be um, more active in my role at managing ERGs. So turning it over to you, Jay. 
Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for everyone uh, joining us and those who couldn't join. We didn't record this session um, because, well, it says it's recording, but essentially I don't think it's going to like stay recording or I don't think it's going to be shared anywhere else. Um, I was told it wasn't going to be recorded so that we all can share safely. Um, so I don't, I don't think we'll be able to see it after, but I think it says it's recording. Um, but essentially just like, thank you so much for, uh, being in the space with us for opening up and for whatever you shared. And if you didn't feel comfortable sharing or if you had nothing to contribute, thank you for sharing space with us and listening to us during this time. We know it's like the last day of the three days uh, for Techidia's um, LHM Summit. So just really appreciate you all sharing space with us. Would be happy to connect with you on LinkedIn. I put it in the chat a little bit earlier, but essentially it's just my full name on, on LinkedIn. But um, if you have anything else or if you want to share, uh, feel free to pop into the, the messages on there. But um, yeah, we just wanted to give you all some tools to really leave with so that you can take them into your communities um, at work and beyond work. This goes for like parents. This goes for friends. This goes for uh, partners. Like these are all like tips and tricks and ways that you can create safe spaces wherever you go at their grocery store. So hopefully you <laughs> took away something and if you have anything you wanted to share, feel free to share on like LinkedIn or with us um, personally. But thank you so much, y'all, and hope you have a beautiful weekend. Thanks, everyone. Have a really great weekend. And thank you to Tequeria for having us. Bye. Thank you, Tequeria. Adios. Mm -hmm.